So if you would please turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11. We're going to read two verses this morning out of Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> We're going to read the first two verses. And this morning I want to talk about, and the title of my lesson this morning would be Rebuild the Temple. Rebuild the Temple. So Revelation chapter number 11, I believe most of you are probably there. We've been in Revelation a lot, so you probably are aware of where it's at. It's the last book of your Bible. Revelation chapter number 11, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your Holy Spirit, not my words. Lord, that it would move through the members, Lord, that are here in the auditorium this morning, that it would meet the needs of those maybe sitting in their home. Those in other countries, Lord, I ask that it would this word would go forth and it would be an encouragement and a blessing to each one of them. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit be with me in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> There's a few things in verse number one I want to take notice of. The first of those is he's asked to measure the temple. To measure the temple. But he's also asked to measure the the altar, and then to measure them that worship therein. I looked up the definition of the meaning of the word measure, and most of us know it. We know what it is to measure. I was a carpenter, and that was my main job probably for the first seven years of my marriage. And I used a lot of tape measures. Would go through a lot of them. I'd break them and have to buy a new one. But I briefly want to go over the definition with you because I want to lay a really good foundation to the importance of measuring and how we measure. The definition, the first one that popped up is measure as certain the size, amount, or degree of something by using an instrument or device marked in standard units or by comparing it with an object of known size. Now, I thought that was pretty interesting, that first definition, because, like I said, I've used a tape measure. Many women in here have used a yardstick, a ruler. Uh, if you're a teacher like Miss Marilyn, she probably whacked kids on the knuckles early on with her rule. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. You were a public school teacher, right? <laughs> so maybe she didn't. But uh, many of us, uh, mom probably whipped us with a yardstick at least once. My mom favored the uh, orange race car track, which was her choice, <laughs> which was this flimsy elect uh, uh, a plastic thing that, you know, would catch a lot of speed as she hit us. And it wasn't like a switch because it was uh, always readily available. We had a lot of racetracks. But I wanted to notice something, I want you to notice something here, an object of known size. And I want you to notice, before we go back into some of the Old Testament passages, a lot of times they would use what's called a cubit to measure. And the cubit is this span from here to the elbow. And that's a measurement of known size. But I also found that when I looked up the word measure, there were a few other definitions that I found interesting. One of them is this, to estimate or assess the extent, the quality, or the value of effect of something. The value. That kind of hit me. Keep that in your mind as we go through the Bible this morning. Also, I want you to consider carefully, which is what I want each of you to do this morning, is just bear with me. The first few things I'm going to read, you may think has no uh, purpose in what I'm going to get into this morning, but I promise you that you'll get a blessing out of this this morning if you just bear with me. So the first thing I want to bring up this morning, my first point would be the building of the temple. 
the building of the temple. Like I said, we're going to rebuild the temple. But in order to rebuild the temple, we need to see what went into the building of the first temple. So if you would, please, you don't need to hold your place in Revelation 11. Go to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25, which is, your, is the second book in your Old Testament. Exodus chapter number 25. Exodus 25. <clears throat> I'm not going to read every verse in this chapter. I'm going to pull out some of the important ones, or what I believe is important, to what point I'm going to try to bring out this morning. But in Exodus chapter number 25, verses 1 through 9, talk about the offerings for the tabernacle. I'm not going to read all of them, but in verse number 1, the Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. Verse 3. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. point I wanted to bring out of this is willingly with the heart. See, when you rebuild a temple, you have to do it willingly and with the heart. And when you offer something in the temple, it had to be willingly and of your heart, right? We all know this, Brother Harry, he's mentioned it multiple times before we take an offering, that you should give it out of the willingness of your heart. God honors that. He honors a cheerful giver, right? That's what the Bible says. Now, verses 10 through 22, talk about the ark. Talks about the ark. And I want you to notice between verses number 10 and verse number 22, the term gold is mentioned 17 times. 17 times gold is mentioned. Now, if you go verses number 23, verses number 23 through verse number 30, you'll notice that it is a table that's being made to go in the temple. And I want you to notice something that gold is also mentioned in the fabrication of this temple. Gold. <clears throat> now, Verses number 31 through verse number 40 in Exodus chapter 25 speaks of the candlestick, which is also made and layered in gold. See, God's given them a very great detail in how they're to operate as a church. God has brought forth many great examples throughout his word, the delicate care in how we're to worship him and how the temple was to be made and how the pieces and the instruments in the temple and the people that ministered into the temple, the priests, there, it was very detailed. So when John is told to measure, I believe he's measuring the value. But we're looking at it right now as gold, and gold has very intrinsic value. But I'm going to turn to another meaning of gold here in a little bit. And I'm going to show you that the best meaning of gold is not the physical meaning that we see here. Because there is value in the temple. Okay? Keep this in your mind. Chapters number 26, the tabernacle. Seven times is gold mentioned as well. Chapter number 27, verses 1 through 8, the altar talks of gold as well. Oh, I'm sorry, this one does not have gold. And actually, chapter 27 is the shortest chapter out of the four or five I'm mentioning. It only has 21 verses. And I want you to notice that gold is not mentioned in this chapter. Now, if you have time to go back and study this, that'll be great. But for the sake of time this morning and the point I'm going to bring across this morning, um, it isn't as relevant for me to go through all these verses. But in, in Exodus chapter 28, the detail is mentioned again. Detail. There's a lot of detail in this chapter, and gold is also mentioned 17 times. Do you know gold is mentioned 419 times in your King James Bible? 419 times. Do you know that more than a quarter of those times have to do with the building of the temple or the instruments used in the temple? Did you know that? So if there's so much detail given to the temple, and John is standing outside in the book of Revelation in chapter number 11, and he's told to measure the inside of the temple and the altar of the temple, and he's told not to measure 
outside of the temple. I believe there's a hidden meaning in this and nothing that's going to be spooky or nothing that's going to take you off into any weird doctrine. But I believe there's a really neat point brought out in the way that John describes it in the first two verses of Revelation 11. See, John is looking at the temple, the physical temple. But I believe there's another meaning to the temple. And this is the temple that we need to be concerned with rebuilding. Okay, let's let prophecy rebuild the third temple, but let us concern ourselves with the most important temple this morning. And I want you to notice that God put a lot of great detail in these chapters in the book of Exodus in regards to the first temple. There's a lot more detail than what I briefly went over this morning. If you were to read all this, you would see that there were detailed measurements. There's detailed instructions on every piece that's placed in the temple. God is a very detailed God, right? You're going to see that this morning. But after the temple was built, there was a time in which the temple would then be dedicated or sanctified unto the Lord. So just bear with me, please, because I want you to notice that I believe the reason why these te this temple is so detailed is because there's another temple which has just as much detail as this temple, if not more. And that temple is you. That temple is you. And we're going to study this this morning because I want each one of us to realize that we need to rededicate our temple unto God. If we believe that we're heading towards the last days or we're in them and we're watching the fact that there's multiple named storms in the world today and we're seeing an abundance and a reemergence of more powerful earthquakes, volcanoes are going off everywhere, people are so afraid, they're afraid of their own shadow, they're, they're just bickering and fighting with each other and there's distress of nations and there's perplexity and there's all kinds of things which seem to be falling apart, then wouldn't it make sense? for us to pay extra close detail to our own temple and how we're living our life. Why? That we're not ashamed at his coming, right? Because it's really important when the Lord comes that we're not ashamed, right? There's maybe some things that we need to do in our lives. So the, the second point I want to talk about, the first one was really short. The second one is the dedication of the temple. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Because I want to show you that Jesus focused more on the people than the possessions. You know, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What house would you build me? Right? John chapter 4, this is where Jesus goes into Samaria and he meets the Samaritan woman at the well and he offers her living water. He offers her living water. She perceives that he is a prophet because he tells her about how she's living and she t he tells her that she's not living properly. And in verse number 19, the Bible says, the woman saith unto him, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. But verse 20 is really important. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Look, what I'm getting ready to say does not fly in the face of attending church. Because we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting each other and so much the more as we see the day approaching, the day of the Lord. But Jesus answers her and saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So what's that mean if you don't have a place of worship? That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is, in verse 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship, to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And see, just like in the temple in Exodus chapter number 25, you have to come unto God with a willing heart in spirit and in truth. That's never changed. But in the Old Testament, that was our example of the detail that God placed upon the temple and upon our worship and our service for him. It shouldn't be a light thing, Christian, that we just disregard our worship and our meeting together in church on Sunday or Sunday night and Wednesday night, and then we just go off and do whatever the other six days of the week or whatnot. We need to make sure that we're detailed in our worship for the Lord all the time. All the time. Now, how do you know he's talking about the temple of you? Now, there's many verses in the New Testament, but I want to build a foundation in Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Because, see, you know what? The world and the universities and the teachers of the world, they want to discredit God and how he's built human beings and how he's made us. But in Psalm 139, Psalm 139, I want you to notice something. King David, a man after God's own heart, with all of his flaws and imperfections, was able under the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, was able to pen this in verse number one. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Hey, be careful what you do. Be careful what you say and be careful what you see. Because the Bible says there is no thought withholding of thee. God knows everything. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Keep this in your mind. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? When you leave church, you haven't left God in the building. Keep that in your mind the other six days out of the week. When you're in church, yeah, when two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. But be careful because when you leave, you haven't left God here. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Pastor preached on the right hand of Jesus several months ago. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Hey, there's nothing hidden from God. So don't try to hide it. Why? Because you're a temple. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Hey, be careful, abortion doctors. God's covered children in the womb. Now here's what I want to focus on for just a moment to show you something that I found exciting out of God's word and then some other statistics I'm going to read. I will praise thee. And every one of us should be thankful to God for everything we have, especially the fact we're alive today. Oh, I know many of us have ailments. I know many of us have physical problems. But we, shall, we should praise him. Why? For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that my soul knoweth right well. Now, I'm going to read a few stats. I brought in my iPad. It was easier to take pictures of this than it was for me to copy it all down. I want you to notice that the same amount of detail that was put in the temple, more detail was put into you this morning. The human skeleton is the internal framework of the human body. It is composed of around 270 bones at birth. 270 bones and a little baby? Hey, and you think, hey, when I get older, I got to get more bones, right? No, matter of fact, it's the opposite. This total decreases to around 206 bones by adulthood. After some bones get fused together, the bone mass in the skeleton reaches maximum density 
around age 21. Hmm. Yeah. But the problem with me is I quit growing up and I started growing out. Amen. Check this out. There are four main blood groups, types of blood. A, B, A, B, and O. Your blood group is determined by the genes you inherit from your parents. Each group can be either RHD positive or RHD negative, which means in total there are eight blood groups. Hey, are you fearfully and wonderfully made this morning? How many cells are in the human body? Adult humans have somewhere around 25 trillion RBCs in their body on average. Hey, that's almost as much as the national debt now, isn't it? A normal resting heart rate for adults ranges from 60 to 100 beats per minute. Generally, a lower heart rate, r rate at rest implies more efficient heart function and be better cardiovascular fitness. For example, a well-trained athlete might have a normal resting heart rate closer to 40 beats per minute. That's pretty impressive. That's exciting, isn't it? Get this, though. Your heart beats around 100,000 100, times in one day. One day, your heart beats 100,000 times, about 35 million times a year. During an average lifetime, the human heart will beat more than 2.5 billion times. You think man could ever build a machine that would work like that? Never. You think by some happenstance and chance that that just fell into place? Do you realize your heart... If you were to hold a tennis ball and squeeze it, you're using the same amount of force your heart uses as it pumps blood throughout your body. How many of you have ever squeezed tennis balls? New ones out of the can. They're pretty hard, right? The largest internal organ by mass is the liver with an, with an average of 1.6 kilograms, which is 3.5 pounds. The largest external organ, right? The skin, your skin. Most people don't realize that their skin's an organ. But I thought this was pretty interesting too. The longest muscle is the sartorius muscle in the thigh. That's your longest muscle. Isn't that odd? I thought the longest muscle for most people was their tongue. Yeah, that took me off guard completely. You realize how complex your brain is? Do you realize how complex it is? There are 86 billion neurons in the human brain. 86 billion. I think that's more than more neurons in the brain than Warren Buffett has money. I think he's somewhere under 86 billion. Do you realize that the human brain is the most complex structure in the universe? And scientists and doctors have still not uncovered the human brain. Now, I thank God for those that are able to perform brain surgery. I thank God for the specialists, like the one Marilyn's brother David's going to go see, that can possibly save his life or give him a better uh, comfort in life so that he doesn't have to struggle with swallowing and breathing. I thank God that he's given physicians the opportunity to be able to help people. But I'll tell you this right now, not every doctor, not every average physician can do those things, right? Right, Marilyn? you got to find a specialist. In human beings, you're only able to find one who can work on certain parts of the body. But God works on all the parts of the body at all times because through him all things consist. At all times. You're not breathing by accident. What makes you breathe? What makes things go? What makes you who you are? What makes you a temple with such detail? What makes you that temple? How complex is the human eye? The eye is one of our most important sensory organs. Hardly any other organ is as complex. The human eye is capable of absorbing and instantly processing more than 10 million pieces of information per second. Wow. 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 That's crazy. But even more crazy than the human eye the human brain is the most simple of all things. And that is the single cell life 
cell. A single cell has more complexity and more detail than any of those. Did you know that? And yet scientists, to try to disprove the Bible, to try to disprove God, will constantly try to make you inferior and to just control you and to get you to think your life is worthless. And that children in the womb, whether they're uh, going to be perfect without blemish or whether they're going to come out of the womb with some issues or different things and they want you to abort these children look all life is precious god made everyone for a specific reason and he wants you to fulfill those reasons the single cell i i, I did find this this was interesting and this is their champion right an evolutionist champion because let me tell you something the champions are so smart they're so much smarter than god these evolutionary champions like Charles Darwin. As Darwin said, and you note, the concept is valid, but we have no working examples. Really, Darwin? Why don't you go smoke some more peyote leaves, you weirdo? That guy has lost his mind. He's lost his mind. The complexity of the cell, the cell is the most complex and most elegantly designed system man has ever witnessed. Professor of Biology Michael Denton, in his book entitled Evolution, A Theory and Crisis, explains this complexity with an example. This is a doctor that's having trouble grasping evolution. Yeah. To grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it's 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings like portholes of a vast spaceship opening and closing to allow the continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter into one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity beyond our own creative capacities, a reality which is the very antithesis of chance, we, which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man. You can't copy this stuff. You're telling me God's not the creator? You're telling me that when he created you and he wanted you to worship him, the detail he put in your human body magnifies the temple ten times over. We look at the gold that was put in the temple. We look at the different types of woods that, that, that were used. If we look at uh, First Chronicles and First Kings, when King Solomon, uh, when, he's, when he built the temple and, and all the wood and all the architects and all the people that he gathered for that second temple and all the gold and silver and brass and the instruments and all these things and, and how important it was for every detail to be right on the money. And then you look at our human bodies and we're fearfully and wonderfully made Ten times above anything that the intelligence of man can comprehend, duplicate, or imitate. Isn't that awesome? That our temple, our body is as a temple. But you know what? There's a problem today because the problem is, is for some reason, with all the information we have that points to God, we're losing our children and our grandchildren to this. Did you know this? To this false evolution theology it's a religion evolution's a religion and matter of fact it, the bible even says and science avoid foolish questions and genealogies and science falsely so called they're not forming a hypothesis they're forming theology based upon what they see and there's a reason for it do you realize that 70% of Christian kids lose their faith from the ages going to school from kindergarten to 12th grade? 70% of our Christian kids are losing their faith going to these so-called seats of learning. 70%! That leaves 30%. Do you realize that out of the 30% when they go off to college, a secular university, do you realize 21% lose their faith in God by the time they hit the secular university 
21%. You want to know why our churches are void of young people and young families today? Well, it's no mystery to me. None. Because they're being deceived. Because the devil has an agenda to deceive. And he's filling it every day, his quota. See, he wants the worship. You know, in Revelation, what we've gone through in Revelation 13, he causeth all, both small and great, bond and free, rich and poor, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Why? So they can worship him. He wants to take them away from God, and he wants to set up this, this, this uh, idolatry in their own heart where they think they know more than God. And instead of going off to university, instead of listening to your dope smoking, hippie, long hair, ponytail having preacher, or preacher, professor who's preaching the gospel of evolution, who thinks he knows more than God, and he doesn't know nothing at the end of the day, all he can do is regurgitate what he studied in college himself, and that he regurgitates year after year after year of the same thing, never using his mind to think outside of the box to think there must be something greater than me out there I must have a creator there must be something that holds me together instead he, he, just, he just teaches your children what to believe and most times it's because they don't want anything to do with God nothing we're very complex turn in your Bible to um, Psalm 114 Psalm 114. I'm sorry, Psalm 14. My fault. Psalm 14. <clears throat> you know, if we don't teach our kids, we need to be careful. Someone will. Someone will. Well, I knew this kid who went off to college and he debated his professor. Say, okay, so you knew one kid. You knew one kid that could stand up. You knew one kid that had the Holy Spirit and was man enough or woman enough to stand up against this stupidity. Wait, you're calling them stupid? I'm telling you right now, they may be book smart, but when it comes to spiritual things, they're stupid. Amen. Stupid. Period. I don't care how many hairs you put in a ponytail and the rest of your head's receding. I don't care if you got glasses on and you smell like a pipe. I don't care, Mr. Professor. You think that makes you any smarter because you wear a smoking jacket and you, and you sit around in penny loafers and you tell everybody that there are no absolutes? Hey, guess what, fool? Absolutely one day you will die. You will die. And you better not die a fool. Verse number one, the fool, stupid, has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Now, I want you to be real careful because this doesn't mean that everybody doesn't do good or, or everybody's bad because this is actually talking about those who deny God and are doing abominable works. There's none of them that doeth good. Why? Because they're abominable. Yes. Okay. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all, and this is the kicker, all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge. Because the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I can show you the evidence of your heart beating. What holds that together? What even hold? You know, human beings uh, are skeletons on the inside, but most of the insects and things in the insect world, they have what's called an exoskeleton, which is on the outside, which protects them. Do you realize what holds everything together in you is nothing but soft tissue? And yet we just take life for granted and do whatever we want. Because we're invincible, right? Because we're driving around with armor on. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread. And call not upon the name of the Lord. See, because there's a difference between the children of men and the children of God. Did you know that? But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name. And there are people out there that will not sleep till they cause others to fall. That's in Proverbs chapter 8. They won't rest until they cause others to fall. Their sleep is taken from them. They're trying to deceive you. They're trying to deceive 
deceive your young people and your family and your kids as you spend, this is the kicker, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to send them off to be brainwashed. When all they really need to do is get a book and read it. You're a professional after 10,000 hours of doing something. You're considered a professional. Did you know that? I mean, you know, sometimes we put too much faith in doctors and people that are in authority. Do you know why? Because maybe, maybe, do you want to go to a doctor and pick the doctor who was off partying and got the cheat sheet the night before so he could hurry up and cram through an exam? Or do you want to get the guy who actually studied who actually showed up to class. And how do you know which one you get? You're better off trusting in God. You are. Trust not in the physicians. Be careful. Be careful. But yet we just so blindly half the time just follow everybody because they've got a PhD in post hole digging. Post hole digging. Oh, you're making fun of people of higher academia. Are they really? Most of them have no knowledge. Oh, they've got, they've got all the book knowledge, but they've got no knowledge and wisdom. Half of them can't even tie their own shoes. I work for all kinds of doctors. I work for all kinds of lawyers. Oh, they may be able to win a court case, but I'll tell you one thing they can't do is figure out how to fix the simplest thing in their house. Can't even fix the simplest thing in their house. I can't believe you're putting all these people down. Hey, look, if, if you come to my Sunday school class or Wednesday night, get ready because it's not going to be the last time I put somebody down. Okay? It's not going to be the last time I'm going to say something that might shock you. <clears throat> Chapter 53 of Psalms. Psalm 53. You know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm going to let God work in me. I'm going to let God do it all. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm not going to lean onto my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge Him. He'll direct my paths. If I break my leg, I'll go to the hospital. But if I'm confused on some doctrine, I'm not going to John MacArthur. If I mess up on some doctrine, I'm not going to Joel Osteen. I'm going to search the Scriptures because in them, so many of the prophets thought they had eternal life. I'm going to go to the source. I have a heart attack, which I could. I'll go to the hospital. But if I got a problem that doesn't require that kind of, of surgery or something, I'm not going to go for every boo-boo, everything that needs a Band-Aid, every cough, every little, I stub my toe. Now you sound like a professional athlete. Psalm 53, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Corrupt are they. Who? The people that said there is no God. Why are you sending your kids to that university? They learn more reading books, reading the Bible, than they'd ever learn from some dope-smoking hippie professor. I don't care what you say. I, I tell you right now, it, if you wake up early, and you work harder than everybody else, and you do what you say you're going to do, you'll make more money than if you go and waste it at a university. If money's all you care about, there's always another way to make money. Why? Because if you're determined, you'll do it. Why? Because God set it in the heart of every man to be able to accomplish these things. We're built in the image of God Almighty. And if all you care about is that which a lot of people do, then you can make money. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them has gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have the workers of iniquity have no knowledge. Hmm. They think they do. Who eat up my people as they eat bread. They have not called upon God. And let me tell you something right now. Many of them will never call upon God because they know it all. They know it all. Just ask them. Just ask them how many years they've been in school. Ask them how many times they've aced a test. How many of them are valedictorians? Okay, so you went, you paid somebody to teach you something you could have learned in a book. Now, I'm not against all doctors. I'm not against all people who go to college. I'm just saying, Christian, you need to be really careful. You know, it's like 
you should investigate your pastor and assistant pastor and Sunday school teacher and brother Jan, the guy standing up. You should investigate us to know what we believe. By now, I think many of you know what I believe, know what pastor believes, and know what Jan believes because you've been in here long enough to hear it. But so many people will just jump ship and go to all these different churches because they're following some man who has a bunch of titles and things on his wall and they think, wow, I'm, he must know better than me. But the truth is, he may not. He may not. So quickly for the next couple minutes before we close, I'd like to talk about rebuilding the temple. Rebuilding the temple. I had a few other verses I could have went on and on. Turn in your Bible to Lamentations chapter number 4. Lamentations chapter 4, right after Jeremiah. I'm going to go ahead and start reading. Lamentations chapter 4, the first six verses. You ever wonder why gold's important and why it was important to God? You ever think about that? Well, I mean, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns the cattle on 10,000 hills. Do you really think the physical gold is what he cares about? No. Verse number one, how is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. To fine gold. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? Hey, Christian, why are you downgrading yourself? Why are you selling yourself short? You're a temple of the living God. You are gold. You're as good as gold. You have intrinsic value. Quit worrying about how much gold you can stick away for retirement. Start worrying about how much gold, how many people's lives you can make a difference in, how many people you can lead to God, lead to the Lord in salvation, so that you have a heavenly 401k, that you have an earthly reward full of gold, full of people. Even the sea monsters draw out the breasts. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like ostriches in the wilderness. You can check that out in Job 11. They just bury their kids in the sand or their eggs and, and they can be trampled over by any beast. The tongue of the suckling child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread and no man bringeth to them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dung hills. That's God. All the, lords of the, all the words of the Lord are pure. And he's telling you, hey, listen here, fine gold. Why are you embracing the dung hill of drugs and alcohol and pornography and perversion and the things that don't matter? Quit embracing the dung hill gold. You're gold. You're more than fine gold. You have no business touching these things. Your body is a temple of the holy God. You don't need to worry about anything. You have more value than the gold in the temple. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your eye, your neck, your skin, your hands, your fingernails your nose. I mean, when you start thinking of the complexity of the human body, you are worth way more than anything. Why are you selling yourself short? Why are you embracing a dunghill? That's what God said. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have God, and ye are not your own? Christian, you're not your own. Hey, the fool, he's his own. He's a children of man. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. But you're not your own. Why? You're bought with a price. Verse 20. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God's. Don't let your gold become dim. Get rid of the dross. Get rid of the impurities. Why? So your gold can be fine gold, and your light can therefore shine before men. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm turning quick, so... I'm going to go ahead and read in verse number 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but, but just send your kid off to some secular university because it's more important for him to make a living than it is to serve God. 
And that's been the mentality. Oh, we need Christian actors. Oh, yeah, right. Quit embracing the dunghill of Hollywood. Oh, we need Christian doctors. Why? So they can get around a bunch of other people that hate and reject Jesus Christ? No, we need more preachers. We need more missionaries. We need more faithful church members. We need more gold. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What kind of a house will you build for God? If you're saved, you already have a house built for God. It's you. And the Holy Spirit of God rests in you. Where come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Let's rebuild this temple. Let's get our gold cleaned. Let's help others clean their gold. Let's go out and get some new gold. Some new people saved. From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Unlike these universities and public school systems that unfortunately today there are not many Christians working in them. There really isn't. I, I mean, you can, you can say, well, I know this Christian person. Yeah, you, one out of a hundred. One out of a hundred. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all of our tribulation. With everything going on in the world, with everything going on, I still have joy. I'm still happy. Why? Because my happiness doesn't come from the outside. My happiness comes from within. I'm trying every day to polish my gold. Me. The temple inside me. I'm trying every day to draw closer to the Lord. Every day I want to get more of the wickedness of this world and the filthiness and the dunghills and the stupidity and the foolishness and the fear and all the wickedness out of my life more and more and more and more. You know, maybe I wasn't the best son. Maybe I wasn't the best husband. Maybe I wasn't the best father. Maybe I've never been the best Christian. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to try my best now to be the best that I can and get right with God. And continue every day to rebuild this temple. The one in my heart. Remember the table? There's all, I mean, I studied this from 5.30 this morning till it was time to leave. The temple, the showbread, the word of God is symbolized by the bread of life. And we need to remove the fleshy tables of our heart and take on the table that the Lord has given us, the word of God, and sanctify ourselves. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you've given us. The the words, Lord, I ask that you would continue to, to meet our needs, look after us and take care of us, Lord. Not just us here in America, but around the world. We have so many friends, family, and loved ones that are all over the world, Lord. And we ask that you would help them, that they would benefit, that they would realize their intrinsic value. Lord, money isn't everything. Matter of fact, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's why you put it in there. But for us to love people, the real gold, and not this fake gold, this fool's gold, Lord, I ask that you would just be with us. Be with the pastor as he brings the message. Help us to cleanse our temples. In Jesus' name, amen. Now.